Canterbury Journal. On December 20th, 1990, Shepard Nazi was due to deliver a major report on foreign policy. This may be the shortest, the most difficult speech of my life. Since his spring interview, the balance of forces had tilted sharply. A dictatorship is coming. No one knows who it will be or what this dictator will do. No one knows what sort of order there will be. I would like to announce I am resigning. Don't interrupt. Let me finish. Don't shout at me. Let that be my protest against the coming dictatorship. Personally, maybe I agree with my critics. Maybe I let Gorbachev down. Maybe. But perestroika and democracy are more important than our friendship. Even though we've been friends for decades. Of all the comrades with whom Gorbachev had set out in 1985, Shevard Nazi was the last to go. His early ally, Yegor Ligachev, had turned opponent and been forced out. Nikolai Rishkov, now a prime minister without power, suffered a heart attack. Gorbachev's liberal conscience, Alexander Yakovlev, faded into the shadows. With Shevard Nazi's resignation, Gorbachev stood alone. The prophecy of approaching dictatorship was to be tested in Lithuania. The new nationalist government had already declared independence. They rejected Moscow's control and boycotted the Soviet parliament. For months, conservatives in Moscow had called for action. Now, Gorbachev allowed the generals to call the shots. The military preparations were obvious. New and special units of paratroopers were sent to Lithuania. When you consider that the war in the Persian Gulf was expected to break out, we knew there would be war in two places at the same time, and that the war in the Gulf would overshadow the aggression in Lithuania. Special forces, directly responsible to Moscow, took over a number of public buildings. Shots were fired and civilians injured. Gorbachev accused the Lithuanian government of inviting the crisis, but he promised his troops would act with restraint. On the third night I went home because I was told it would be quieter and I wanted to sleep in my own bed. But I didn't even get a half hour's rest. I only had time to get into the bath when the phone rang, saying the tanks were moving. I tried to call President Gorbachev in Moscow. His aide answered the phone. He said President Gorbachev could not be reached. He couldn't come to the phone. I told the aide to tell the president that the army tanks are attacking the unarmed people.
I asked him to tell the president to stop the tanks immediately. On Sunday, Gorbachev called. I told him about the events in Lithuania. He had a totally different story. He said he didn't know about the tanks. He had been told his troops acted in self-defense, that separatists and extremists had attacked first and his troops responded. He thought only two had died. Well, I already knew that 12 had died. In fact, 13 had died. The next morning, Marshal Yazov, the Minister of Defense, reported on events. Gorbachev and I had arranged to meet at 11 on Monday. While I was in his reception room, I watched the TV monitor, which showed the Supreme Soviet and the report by Yazov. The main reasons for the crisis are well known. They are the government of Lithuania. They use democratic slogans, but they are imposing a dictatorship of the bourgeoisie. They attack the workers' state, in particular, the role of the army. So when I went into Gorbachev, I told him what I'd been watching. He was about to go there and speak. I said, I believe that he had to remove himself from everything. He told me, let's finish our business. I haven't seen anything. I'll decide what to say later. So you see, he didn't take my advice. At about 12 noon today, I had a conversation with the chairman of the Lithuanian Republic, Landsbergis. It was very unproductive. Frankly, speaking from this conversation, I'm getting the impression that it will be very difficult to carry on a dialogue while such people are heads of republics. Gorbachev expressed regret for the killings, but promoted one of the responsible ministers. Within weeks, troops were patrolling the street of Moscow and other big cities, ostensibly to combat rising crime. Yeltsin claimed the dictatorship Shevardnadze had predicted was beginning. In 1987, I warned that Gorbachev lusted after power. Now he has a dictatorship with a pretty name, presidential rule. I cannot support the president and his policies, and I call for his immediate resignation. I know all about Yeltsin. I know him. I just want people to see him for what he is. He's not holding a serious or intelligent dialogue. It's all desperation. That's all. Meetings, rallies, hunger strikes, calls for disobedience, calls for disbanding the Supreme Soviet and Congress and for the president to resign. These are not democratic methods and they can lead to a repeat of the 1917 revolution and put the country on the brink of civil war.